Welcome to our Good Friday service here at Village Church. If you are new, a special welcome to you. So glad that you are joining us. My name is Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at Village Online. I'm so excited for this Good Friday service. Now, this service might seem a little bit different. At times, you might feel a sense of somberness or even sadness. That is okay because there is good news on the other side of this service. And that's going to happen on Easter and encourage you to tune in exactly how you're watching this for our Easter service. But for this service, I want to encourage you to really experience what God has for you. Now, there will be a couple different movements throughout this service. At the end, there will be an invitation to partake in communion. Traditionally, the elements that are used are bread and wine, but you can substitute those symbols out for whatever you have available to you. Now, you may notice that we are in the auditorium, and it is completely empty. Actually, this is where our Surrey location meets, but we have cleared this out so that you, Village Online, can experience this service. Our online production team is here and our online worship team is here and we're solely focused on you and us as a church. And so I just wanna encourage you, put away distractions and really focus in for what God has for you. So the worship team is gonna come out now. Now let's worship together.
As we look at Jesus' movement towards the cross during the final hours of his life, let's first look at him in the Garden of Gethsemane, pleading with the Father. Matthew 26 and verse 36 says this, Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, Sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Here's what's happening here in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is experiencing very real human emotions of grief and sorrow and pain and literally suffering. He's suffering and he's experiencing this grief for for two reasons. One, because uh, from a physical sense, he's about to experience the most excruciating pain any human of his time would experience the Roman crucifixion. And he's preparing himself for that and everything in him is screaming out, not wanting to go through with it. But secondly, he's also experiencing spiritual pain and spiritual grief because he's about to take on the sins of the world. He's about to pay the punishment, the penalty of all of mankind's sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and 21, it says, For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering of our sin so that he could be made right, we could be made right with God through Christ. And when Jesus talks about the cup of suffering, it's the cup of wrath that that the writers throughout the Old Testament talked about, which would be the the price, the, the, the wrath of God, the anger of God being poured out on the sins of the world. And Jesus was about to experience this. He was about to receive all of the wrath of God upon himself for your sake and my sake, for the redemption of our sins, for the forgiveness of our sins. And let's look at how Jesus responds to this. How does Jesus respond to the most painful moment of his life? He does it not by moving away from God, but by moving towards God in prayer, in pleading. Jesus is honest about exactly what he is feeling. He tells the Father exactly what's going on in his heart his emotions, his soul, the pain and the grief that he's suffering with and struggling with. And it's a model for us. You know, when we experience pain and grief and trouble in life, and we all do, it's the human condition. God is calling for us to move towards him and to be honest, to be open, to express ourselves fully and completely to him. I remember years ago when I lost, uh, we lost our first daughter, um, 22 weeks in the womb, And uh, it was a very painful time in our life. And I remember uh, shutting myself in a room and just crying out to God and expressing to him exactly how I felt in that moment. And that's what God wants us to do with pain, with grief, is to come to him. I remember the other day, my wife and I were talking about a mutual friend who's um, going through a lot of addiction right now. And she reminded me, she said, Fanu, the reason he's going through these addictive behaviors is because of the pain that he's experienced in the past. And that's what happens often if we go to substances, if we go to relationships to to take care of that pain, to get rid of that pain, it usually doesn't end up well. But what really matters is that we take it to the Lord, we take it to the Father. I love what Jesus says when when he's praying. He says, my Father, there's something so powerful about understanding the intimacy that we can have with God. As we look at the model of Jesus praying and pleading in the Garden of Gethsemane, it talks to this relationship that we can have with God, which is what this Easter weekend, what Good Friday is all about, that we can be adopted into the family of God. Earlier today, I was in a conversation at a store with someone, and and the topic of God and religion came up, and, and this person said to me, I... 
I understand God in the sense of karma, like the universe. If I do good things, the universe is good to me. If I do bad things, I end up uh, paying the price and the penalty of those bad things that I did. And, and the way he described God was so removed and far from him. There wasn't a sense of relationship. And yes, God is transcendent, but in the Bible, it's so clear, and this is what Easter is all about, is that God wants to have a personal relationship with you and with me. In Hebrews chapter 4 and 14 to 16, it says, So then, since we have a high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. And this is what I explained to this person. I said, hey, in Jesus, if you could put your trust in Jesus, he knows exactly what you're going through. He understands every facet of the human experience because he's fully God and he was fully human. He experienced the pain, he experienced the grief, he experienced the suffering, and, and this is what makes him approachable, that we can take the worst things about what we experience in life. We can take it to God. We can take it to Jesus because he experienced it, he understands it. And then we look at what does the father do in this moment? What does God do in response to the pleading of his son? You know, in Luke 22, where... Uh, the gospel writer there, Luke, talks about the same story. Uh, he talks about the multiple times Jesus prays. He prays to the Father, then comes back to his disciples and goes back to prayer. And between those times of prayer, he says an angel of the Lord would come and strengthen Jesus. Often when we go through pain and suffering, the response from God isn't necessarily to rescue us, but it's to give us strength, give us grace to endure through that season of pain, that season of suffering. Listen, the, 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 the sorrow and the tragedy of the human experience is common to all of us, and, and there's no denying that that's gonna happen in our lives, but what really matters is in those moments, are we looking at God for strength? Are we looking to him to fill the void and fill the gap and to comfort and bring peace into our hearts, into our lives? Tim Keller once said, I've learned 10 times more about the grace of God in the dark times than I have in prosperity. I think about the dark times of my own life. I remember uh, years ago, um, when I was still in my teens, I, I experienced sickness, uh, illness. I was uh, sick. I was in bed, bedridden for many, many months. Uh, I remember it felt like my life was on pause. I, I had sores all over my body, couldn't move, couldn't leave the home, couldn't do really anything, just, just completely um, not able to function. And uh, a mentor of mine, a godly man, said to me, he says, uh, Fanu, uh, God is going to work in your heart in such a way in these days, in these moments of your life, through the suffering, through the pain you're experiencing. And one day you'll look back and you'll thank God for everything that he allowed you to endure and how he strengthened you during those times. And I remember saying to him at the time, I said, I just cannot imagine how I could ever be grateful to the Lord for all of this pain and all of this suffering and all of this sickness that's in my body in this moment. And this went on for many months. But you know, when I think back upon that and I was reading this text this week and, and preparing to talk to you, I reflected on my own life and I said, it's true. It's true, I went through so much pain in those moments and yet I was so much more closer to my father because of that, to my heavenly father because of that. I, I, I became so conscious of his love for me and his presence in my life, his strength that was all I needed, the grace of God was all I needed in those moments. And I look back and I say to myself, it really set the trajectory of the rest of my life so I could preach the gospel, I could communicate to people all over the world about the goodness of God and the love of, G of God through Christ Jesus. Isaiah 55 and 9 says this, For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And that's what God was doing in Jesus in that moment. He knew that the plan of salvation had to be fulfilled. Jesus had to endure the cross. He had to become the sacrifice for the sins of the world so God could redeem the world. God could adopt 
us who believe in Jesus into his family. But in those moments, God was with his son. God was with Jesus. The father was with Jesus, strengthening him, filling him with the grace he needed to endure that moment so that Resurrection Sunday could come. That's what I want to leave with you today, the idea that when you plead and when you're in the darkest moments of your life, run to God, and when you're in his presence, know that his grace is sufficient. Know that in the pleading, God is strengthening you and preparing you for his plan. Sometimes it's so difficult for us to understand that plan. I didn't understand it 18, 19 years ago when I went through the crisis of my life, when I went through illness in my life, but now when I look back, I see the hand of God holding me throughout that season fulfilling his perfect plan for my life. After the pleading came acceptance. Once arrested, Jesus was brought before the high priest in the Sanhedrin to be put on trial. Mark 14, 55 says the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy the temple made with human hands. In three days, we'll build another not made with human hands. Yet even then, the testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and did not give an answer. Here's Jesus blameless, the perfect judge over all things is now being judge. He, after having a sleepless night of praying, is now being dragged into this false trial during the night to be accused by those who are twisting testimonies to as quickly as possible get him to the, pen, the death penalty. This wasn't an unfamiliar place for Jesus to be. All throughout the gospels, 
The Sadducees, priests, Pharisees, religious leaders would constantly accuse Jesus of breaking the law, of being associated to the devil, of twisting his words and his ministry to get him in trouble. And every single time, Jesus eloquently responds with the perfectly placed answer that simultaneously not just upholds the integrity of the law, but addresses and rebukes the religious accusers and teaches his new form disciples something new about the kingdom of God. Every time Jesus' response is perfect. And here again, his life on the line more probably than ever. You're expecting, man, he's going to drop the bomb. This is it. He's gotten out of these situations all the time. We've seen this moment play out. And instead of rebuking, accusing, or doing anything correcting, he stands there in silence. Man, this is Jesus who could easily have wordsmithed his way out of any situation with ease. And with the same effort, he could have called down angels by his power and carved out an exit to continue on with his ministry. But he stands in silence. Why? Why does Jesus do this? Because there's something that usurps our ideas of what we think is best and our need to defend what is right, and even our need to prove our own innocence. It's obedience to the Father. Here, Jesus shows all humanity in this very critical moment, his unwavering, radical allegiance to the Father's will. You will not find a more potent and raw image of self-denial in all of history than this moment. And this moment should resound in our hearts as we try our best to fall in line with Jesus and pursue him. This is the way of life. This is self-denial. Orienting my life around the work of Jesus translates to obedience to the Father. But man, this is hard. Because if we're honest, we have ideas, don't we? We think we know what's best all the time. We think we know how life should go, what we should prioritize with our family, why we should be married by now, how we should answer that work email, why I should be focusing on the right thing or I should be doing more important things on the team or I shouldn't go to that dangerous place. You know, a friend of mine who's a pastor, I remember hearing him preach at his church and I was sitting at the back pew And this is a man he shares that he brought, he felt called by God to not only go himself, but bring his whole family to a pretty dangerous part, uh, a war-torn area of Africa. And he shares a story in his sermon of actually how rebels came into the city and he heard gunfire go across the city block. He actually saw a bullet hole right in his kitchen. His whole family dropped to the deck in that moment. And he's sharing this story I'm sitting there and I'm, I honestly, I'm judging him. Man, what a bad dad. You, you, you drag your whole family to a dangerous place. Are you supposed to be the protector of your home? Are you supposed to be the protector of your family? Isn't that what God asks us to do? God would never allow you to put your family in danger. That's not what Christians do. And it wasn't until weeks later that I felt like I had this thought, maybe prompted by the spirit, that maybe I have zoned in and, and brought and brought the scope of what God calls us to do is too, is too narrow. Maybe my, my scope of what Jesus asked us to do is, is more narrow than I originally thought. And there's this thing of, of the safety of my own family, which is a good thing, something we should pursue and have. Maybe in my head that actually trumped God's will. You know, you can have all of me, God. You can have all of me, all of my life, but these things... I've already concluded you would never ask these things of me. So I'm, I'm shelving that for the table conversation. You can ask anything here, but I've already concluded this, this is off the table. You know, don't we, don't we do that? You know, what are the things for you that you've shelved, that you've already made conclusions God would never? How many God would never statements have you made when determining what God actually is calling you to? It's the reason Peter, only a couple chapters earlier, he rebukes Jesus. When Jesus starts to allude to his imminent death in the future, Peter said, that's a bad plan, Jesus. That's not a good game plan. 
that we got a good thing going here. We're seeing results. People are actually coming to know you. Your discipleships, your disciples are growing. People are being healed. People are being liberated. The sick are getting better. There's momentum here. People are hearing about us all over the place. What do you mean that this is going to end soon? You know, and for us, there's a feeling, a sense for us, even when we hear these stories of when Jesus talks about his impending death, it's just illog- it's illogical. It doesn't sound right. We start to associate with Peter, the light of the world, the redeemer, the prince of peace, our Messiah that we were anticipating for so many years is going to die at the age of 33? That doesn't make sense. Three years of ministry, that's it? Really? The sometimes painful practice of believing and accepting that the Father is up to something grander, more beautiful, more rich, more true, more impactful than we may or may ever see in this lifetime. And the call to us is to submit, to deny ourselves, because Jesus shows us how in this moment, in this trial. He has every right to speak up and he's silent. He comes under the Father's will. It's that cruciform life. That we just lay down all our desires, all our feelings, all our planned futures, our passions and dreams. Our posture is you bought me with a price. How can I demand autonomy of my life when you gave up your life for me? You know, my wife and I, we, we left a position at our old church. It was tough. Like we love that church. It was an incredible church. We loved the people there. We loved our roles there. We were thriving. We just felt this angst, this move that God was kind of calling us away. And we didn't have like any like set plan. We had nothing in store. The only thing we had solidified, I was going to go back to school into seminary. And that's, you, that costs money. That doesn't, you don't make money. It's not exactly the best financial strategy. But the timing of of myself, my wife coming on staff at Village Church could not be more perfect. You could not plan it better. It was so refined to the detail, the timing, everything was perfectly laid out. We would have never thought that would have been our trajectory, but God knew and all we did initially was take a step forward of we don't know what the future looks like. We don't know what's next, but God, your will trumps ours. And when those painful moments of self-denial come and they will, when the pushback of the world is much like this one in Jesus in verse 60, when the high priest says, are you not going to answer? You know, maybe we have similar questions when we try and step out and follow God's will and accept it. Why would you do that? You're going to jeopardize your job, your career. You're being irresponsible, maybe being good friends with good intentions, saying you're wasting your time. You should do more important things. Doubts start to seep into our lives. Wait, wait, wait. Is his way better than my way? To remember in those moments of doubt and uncertainty, no, 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 no. To follow Jesus and his will is actually the way of life. Not reacting and giving into compulsions, the tyranny of the urgent, instead of orienting your life around the work of Jesus. That is where life is found and life found alone. To be people that are anchored in God's will unshakable, whether crisis or opportunity floods into our life, we are only moved by the leading of God for our lives.
cross the emblem of suffering and shame and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain so I'll cherish the So we've looked at the pleading of Christ, and you could say that the pleading of Christ is a window into his human heart. We've looked at the acceptance of Christ, and you could say that this is the window into Christ's human mind or Christ's human will. But without one more act in this play, those two things don't really matter. And that third act is Christ's obedience. And I think you could say that his obedience is a window into his physical aligning with the will of the Father. We heard that when Jesus was in the garden, he pled with the Father. He said, take this cup from me. And of course, the cup was a metaphor for the cross and the suffering he was going to endure dying But then when he goes to the cross and he actually walks those steps physically and he's nailed there, he's hanging, and this is what we read in John chapter 19, verse 28. 
It says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. Is there a more human phrase than I thirst? This is the divine God, fully human, hanging on a cross, thirsty. John continues to write, a jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, when he had taken the cup and drank from it, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Why am I going on about this physical aspect of Christ? I think the physicality of Christ, the humanness of Christ, is absolutely critical to understanding what is going on in Good Friday. St. Athanasius, an early church theologian, puts it this way when he talks about what Jesus is doing in becoming human and then taking to the cross and, and being resurrected. What he's doing, Athanasius says, is he is the incorruptible, the perfect son of God, the incorruptible, taking on the corruptible, the sinful humanness that we all are. Why? So that it can be made incorruptible, so that we can be redeemed and saved into eternity with Christ himself. In Hebrews 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 17, we read, it says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Jesus had to be made fully human. His incarnation was not something that was partially human, something that was, you know, a, a, a pseudo-human experience, something that was, that was really just divine and spiritual, and he just appeared like a human or is partially human. No, no, no. The incarnation of Christ was that he was fully human in every respect. Why? It goes on in Hebrews 2. So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. Why? To make propitiation for the sins of the people. That's just a fancy way of saying he took on what we deserve in our place. And to do that, to take on the sin of all humanity, he had to become a perfect representation of humanity. He had to become human himself, fully human in every respect. That's the way that the propitiation for sin works. Why did he become fully human? Because the work Jesus did was not a metaphor. It wasn't symbolic. It was real. The work Jesus did on the cross was to physically save us. Jesus physically makes mortal, sinful human beings eternal and incorruptible beings. And what this means for you, and if you get nothing else from this, this is what I want you to understand today. What this means for you is that who you are right now matters. Who you are right now as a human being, everything about you matters to God. Enough to send his son to die in your place. This isn't like other religions where there's this idea that maybe you can escape your, your humanity, your physicality to some ethereal kind of transcendent thing and leave all of this humanity thing behind. This isn't like um, a, a modern techno, technological version of things where it's, it's preaching to us that maybe we can upload our minds and become uh, data somehow, and we can exist forever without our bodies, without some physical human aspect to us. No, no, no. God says through what we see on the cross and the resurrection, he says, no, no, who you are as a human being that I have created, all of you matters to me. And all of you as a human being is worth saving. We're worth saving in our complete humanity. So if we skip ahead, 
Jesus then appears after he's resurrected from the dead. He appears, and in John 20, 27, he says this. He says, he says to Thomas, one of his disciples, he says, put your finger here, and he shows him his hand to see this nail scar in his hand. He says, put your finger here, see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side where the spear had cut him open. He said, do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus' transformed human body bears the scars of humanity. He's interested in your humanity too. And he can transform your scars. God loves you so much that while you were scarred, he redeems you. He redeems those scars. You are never disqualified from the grace of God shown through Jesus Christ because of something in your life, because of anything about you, because of the scars that you carry. No, no, no. Jesus redeems your scars with his scars. And if all of this is just a metaphor, if all of this is just spiritual, that doesn't help you now. But by God's grace, it is. And that is the power of the whole story of Jesus on the cross, that the power is for you now. This isn't just some idea of some future life where you can eventually escape all of this and, uh, and, and, and exist in some better way. This is about the power that Jesus gives you now in your life to transform your scars into something beautiful, something we see in his own transformed body. The power of Jesus in your life is now. This doesn't mean you deny your scars. This doesn't mean you have to solve your life yourself. It's a Christ can do it, and only he can do it. He defeats sin and suffering. And that's the only way to move forward as a human being who is imperfect, who bears scars with any kind of hope. So Jesus addresses our, our physical humanity, but he does something else. He addresses another connection we need as human beings, and that's a connection relationally to other physical beings. And there's this interesting paradox in this where as Christ becomes fully isolated on the cross, in his moment of extreme isolation, being stripped bare, naked and alone, hanging on a cross, dying, in that moment of extreme obedient isolation, what does he do? He actually is creating and establishing a family for you and me, the church. He takes into himself all who would believe, all who would look at him alone, isolated on the cross. And he says, attach yourself to me and to each other for eternity. This is an amazing picture. He heals our scars with his scars. And through his isolation, we find ultimate relationship with him and with each other. The community we attach to in Christ and his church is why we call what we are about to do now communion because it's our connection to him and to each other as the church. In this action, where we take the bread together and we take the cup together, we mimic Christ himself accepting the cup that the Father had for him. We identify with him in his own suffering. But we also, as we are obedient, Christ was obedient, and now together, we move forward in him, in his power. So, depending on how you are engaging with us, this might look a little different. You might be at a site where you've received a packet for communion on your way in, or you might be at a site where this is now going to be distributed to you in the rows, or you may be at home or somewhere else watching this online, with family or friends. And during this next song, without needing to be prompted, 
just when you are ready, after you have contemplated the cross of Christ and what that means for you, the hope that means for you, take it. God, we are so grateful, eternally grateful to you that you would look upon us with our scars and you would say we are worth saving to you. God, that you would look upon us with our scars and say, I want to redeem those scars. That not one of you is too scarred for me. Just look at my son who died in your place, who still bears his scars. God, that we would look upon your son together as the church and be redeemed into a family eternal with you and with each other. Amen. Oh, the perfect Son of God in all his innocence you're walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrow, son of suffering, blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah.
can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the son of suffering. Hallelujah to the son of suffering. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we are so grateful 
that you sent your son to die on the cross and rise again so that we could have a relationship with you. And we could actually have you, Jesus, as our Lord, Savior, and treasure of our life. We ask that this would become a bigger focus in our life. In fact, would you allow us to experience this as everything in our life? The fact that we have you as our Lord and Savior. Pray all of this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Well, that was such a powerful service and a reminder of who God is. He isn't a distant, way off deity. He is a personal God that loves you and wants a relationship with you. And if you have questions, if you're struggling, if you have prayer requests, we would love to come alongside you and pray and help and take you to that next step, whatever it may be. So the best way to do all of that is to go to thisisvillagechurch.com slash connect with us. Now, like I said at the beginning of the service, there is good news on the other side of this, and that is Easter Sunday. That is coming up on this Sunday, our normal service times. You can find that where you watch um, the service. We have three service times, seven, nine, and 11 Pacific Standard Time. So I encourage you to come back and maybe this would be a good opportunity to invite some friends or family before you have that Easter dinner. Come together and watch that service in the celebration that God is alive and he wants a relationship with you. So thank you so much for joining and we'll see you at our Easter service. Thank you.